Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here. The least interesting but legally very important thing to say is that should something besides Kevin kind of Whelan and Stephen Ray be on fire tonight, uh, these doors to your right, in addition to the main entrance of Richard King, are a fire escape. Uh, but now beyond that, uh, it's our great pleasure to welcome you. I think it's going to be a very scintillating evening, um, both here in, in the name of the church, where we're going to hear a fantastic presentation um, of really interesting and provocative content. And then, uh, as always, we gather in communion uh, in the rear of the church uh, for some uh, beverages and refreshments and continue chance to engage with our author. Um, before I get to our author, I will uh, announce our special guest, who, due to laryngitis, needs an understudy. But the understudy for Stephen Ray tonight is Stephen Ray, because he's that dedicated. Uh, he's been a friend of the center and a friend of uh, Kevin Leland and his wife, Ann Looney who has been uh, able to lend his considerable vocal talents to us on many occasions. Tonight, he has a bit of voice impairment, and hopefully with the microphone, uh, he'll be able to uh, lend some extra grace to the words uh, that Kevin uh, has written for us. Uh, Stephen Ray, as you know, is an Oscar-nominated actor. Um, first came to light to me and to the world in a big way with The Crying Game, back when I was an undergraduate studying in London. So. Reminds me uh, my own age. Um, you would have seen him in last year's thrilling gothic horror, Red, which you would have noticed carefully because scenes of it were filmed in this very church. And of course, uh, hopefully, you've got a chance to see Blackboard 7, in which he had a truly moving soliloquy. Uh, but I hope if you haven't seen it, you'll take a chance to see it soon. And so that's Stephen Ray, who will be reading from. Uh, our selections tonight from Kevin Whelan. Kevin Whelan, uh, in addition to being uh, a friend, um, is a very well-known and highly regarded scholar, a great and dedicated leader of Notre Dame's food programs here in Dublin for over 20 years now. He is the Michael Smurf Director of the Keogh Mountain Notre Dame Center. Before, in his wisdom and maturity, he settled in with Notre Dame. He had been a visiting professor at New York University, Boston College, Concordia University in Montreal. He lectured in over a dozen countries and at the Sorbonne, in Cambridge, at Oxford, at Torino, at Berkeley, at Yale, at Dartmouth, at Leuven, and even at some pretty good schools besides. He has written or edited 15 books and over 100 articles on Ireland's history, geography, and culture. And for many years, he directed the annual Irish seminar, the leading seminar in the field of Irish studies, whose faculty included Edward Said, Shane C., Derek Wolcott, and many distinguished others, none of which even touches upon his well-known, just asking expertise in all of Irish sport. And with that, I will stop and leave you to our distinguished speaker, Kevin. Uh, thank you very much, Father Bill. Um, such a pleasure always to be in Newman Church. And it was for literally and very aware of the Dan Stoss connection and the Dave Clyde Newman uh, connection. Uh, those who were very well up will realize that Margaret Atwood's new novel, The uh, Testament, um, the sequel to the famous The Handmaid's Tale, has just appeared. And in that, it's very striking that Anne Lydia. Um, who's the one who sets up all that women's subjugation stuff in the original novel, as it turns out in the second one, the Testament, but she actually confesses that she did all that, and very much is highlighted in the forbidden book in the, in the future in which it's set. And what is the forbidden book? It's Newman's Apologia Pro Vita Sua, 1864, originally published. So, you know, in something as significant as Margaret Atwood, Newman is a very distinguished um, presence. So, it's a great pleasure for us all to be here in Newman Church, where I got married, and where my four children were baptized. So, I'm going to do something absolutely ridiculous tonight, and maybe my book is equally ridiculous, which is um, to talk about the role of religion in Irish society from the very earliest period right up to the present day, which is totally preposterous, and uh, I'm still going to do it. Okay, but I understand the preposterous nature of that and the, the arrogance maybe of kind of thinking that you can parachute in on other people, especially if you understand that I feel it and summarize something 
um, in a way that makes sense for the stretches to the video. So, um, I'll begin with this. Um, this is what in the Irish language we would call the Joe Drierke, which means the magic mist or the magic fog. This is Lanning to Green Lake, which is in County Cork, not too far from Ken Mayer. This is something that appears sometimes very quickly and then disappears, usually just after dawn when the sun comes up and the water rises to get this magic mist which comes up, stays for maybe about five minutes and then dissipates again. The Irish believe traditionally that this was the mark of the fairies, the she, um, who are not pretty little things with uh, feathery beams. They are sometimes malevolent, sometimes mischievous, but always magical. And the Irish always had that belief that the material world, the world that we see, is not a real one, that behind it there is another world, and that other world in some respects is more real, because also it exists outside time, and therefore is perennial, whereas the world that we live in, in our short span, is not. So what can I say, what I can talk about as well, is how the Irish religious sensibility is rooted in an unapproached our landscape as well. And of course we begin, don't we, as on the very rainy, rainy rim of Northwestern Europe. The Romans had a look at us, didn't fancy, called us Siberia, the wintry island, and very quickly removed themselves from uh, Ireland. They said they could have conquered and put a legion, but didn't bother because they thought it was as wet, cold, windy. The Irish imagination of Herod was not even the Christian period. It was not of a hot place, but of a cold, wet, Rain, miserable place, cold. How was cold for the Irish? Why not? We're very far north here. Look at today, we walked across, I walked across the Indian Spring. You never see so much pale uh, expanses of white flesh and, and Dublin as you do on a day like today. But it's, it's like warm, it's not exactly hideously warm. But like I was with lads, I think they feel they need to strip off and uh, expose their white, pale, non European flesh. Okay. So now, travel, you know, the Irish are up here, which is really important, up on the edge of the Atlantic. Remember that until well into the 15th century, people believed that if you went too far off that wonderful Atlantic coast of ours, that you might disappear off the edge of the known world, because people believed in a flat air, and out there were hairy monsters, out there was Leviathan and the creatures of the deep. The great Arab geographer, Masuji, in, it's translated as the Meadows of Gold, it's one of the, the, the Arab and Islamic culture is really what invented the geography. But uh, Masuji described the uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, and this is from 947, from the Meadows of Gold. There is no way forward for those who enter from the Mediterranean. Nothing moves upon it. There are no inhabited lands there or rushing beings. Its extent and where it ends are unknown. No one knows how far it reaches. It is called the Sea of Darkness, the Green Sea, or the Encircling Sea. So Ireland shrouded out here in the mark and the mist and the mud and the misery stood on the sill of the antique known world at the time when the Atlantic was really regarded as the world's, the world's uh, watery and chaotic boundary. So for the Romans, we lay, as far as called it, in Ultimo Orbis, on the edge of the earth. And the Irish were very, very aware of that. The very first poem in Ireland, the one that the earliest poem that we can secure today, it's in Latin, but it talks about Hibernia and Insula Extrema Oceania the island of Ireland on the edge of the ocean. So, the, the point I want to make here is there is a remarkably rich effervescence of Christianity when it does arrive in Ireland. And my point about that is why? Uh, because if you look at the spread of Christianity, it began in the eastern Mediterranean. It was only really later, uh, once the Romans began to rise powerfully, that the uh, control of the church moved over towards Rome. It was an Eastern Mediterranean phenomenon before it was a Western one, and the rise of Rome. But here I show the maps of the spread of Christianity, and you can see really that Ireland is way off up there, late when Christianity comes to it. But what is striking then is that if you, if you look around the edges 
of Christianity, of that spread, what you find is that Christianity fused with existing cultures in ways which produced a remarkable set of not various, but remarkable expressions of Christianity which have taken on the coloration, which have taken on the culture of uh, others. So the Armenian church, the Nestorian Christians, the Coptic, the Ethiopian Christians who still going strong, all, all of that. And so around the age, there is a set of vernacular expressions of Christianity. Sometimes we can look at Ireland, and I want to use the term which I have for, and most professional historians have for, Catholic Christianity. Not a thing. This was Christianity. Christianity everywhere took on the impress of the law, but it was still profoundly Christian. And it's ridiculous to expect uniformity in Christianity uh, in late antiquity and American in time. So Christianity proved that it actually strengthened rather than weakened it. It proved promiscuously kind of permeated to local cultural influence. And there was always diversity in how people expressed their Christian faith. But it, it's the tolerance, the permeability, the absorptiveness of local culture, that's actually a strength rather than a weakness. And the idea of orthodoxy came very, very late. So the remote Irish tradition in Northwest uh, Europe was really important in developing what is sometimes called in the jargon syncretic churches. Syncresis, which is where religion combines different beliefs to the blending of originally distinct traditions and then, but while at the same time, asserting the underlying unity and but recognizing uh, an inclusiveness towards the uh, other kind of faiths. So, in some respects, you can see all of these versions of Christianity as being syncretic. Now, the point I want to make, though, is that because Christianity lands out here in Ireland, which is out on the edge of the known world, way out beyond, rather than that being a disadvantage for the Irish, the Irish have to take that on board and kind of say that this is really significant. Because what does it say in the Bible? It says that you may bring salvation all to the ends of the earth. And what the Irish then believed was that they were the ends of the earth, and therefore they were just as important as Rome or Jerusalem in terms of the history of Christianity, because Christianity had to have an origin point, but it also had to have a destination. And the idea also then was eschatology, eschatology which is the, the theology of, of late kings. But the idea is that when the church reached the end of the earth, then it would come the second coming. So the Irish had this belief that rather than being out there in the middle of nowhere, that they were actually hugely important because the instruction of Jesus was to preach his message even to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Patrick and Columba and all those area of saints, they had that very powerful sense that in a sense they were closing the circle of Christianity, and that they were just as important as what happened down in the warm, classical heart of Christianity in the Mediterranean. And that's what gives them an incredible sense of pride and urgency. So Colin Bannis um, talks about this uh, in the six, late 6th century. We Irish, inhabitants of the world's edge, are disciples of saints Peter and Paul. Christ, the true Father, the charioteer of Israel, travels over the channel's surge, over the dolphin's backs, over the swelling flood, and reach even unto us. For lo, the name of the city, which is the King's glory, like something most holy, far removed from heaven's common times, a city once founded to the great joy of almost all nations, had been published far and wide throughout the whole world, even as far as the western regions of Earth's farther strand, miraculously unhindered. By ocean surging floods, though they leaped and rose beyond measure on every side. So Kelba is there claiming this special role for the Irish, that this global message, this centre of the church that has come all the way out down to the very known end of Europe, and that therefore the Irish are hugely significant. And that gave the Irish this incredible kind of self-confidence or cheekiness or arrogance. 
Because, for example, there were quite willing to take on the existing um, centers of knowledge in terms of, say, calculating something like the date of Easter, which is quite a complicated thing to do with lunar cycles and mathematics. But the Irish had no problem whatsoever in telling everybody else they were wrong and the Irish was right. They engaged in very abstruse but prolonged theologic, theological and intellectual disputes with Rome. Um, the Irish relished, in fact, taking on the ancient centers of wisdom. They challenged the Hebrews, the Egyptians, the Greeks, Roman learning, and even cheeked the papacy itself. And Cunningham, who was in some respects a, a supporter of the Pope, expostulated in 631 that only the Irish asserted that they, and they alone, knew what is right. Rome errors, Jerusalem errors, Alexandria errors, Antioch errors, and the whole world errors, except for the Irish. And Cunningham said, that the Irish were regarded by Rome as almost at the end of the earth and a pinnacle on the face of the earth. You just hear the book there, I know it. He describes the Irish as a magnet, a pinnacle on the end of the earth. But here they are with this incredible chief. Why? So as I say, it's to do with this uh, tremendous kind of uh, spread. Now, again, I think that has something to do with the enormous missionary drive and the enormous confidence that includes people like Patrick and all those early successors. There's 5,529 noble examples of what we used to call early Christian, what we now call early medieval Ireland. That is Ireland said between the 5th century and the arrival of the Normans in 1169. 5,500 churches. There isn't that many. There's about 2,200 Catholic parishes in modern day Ireland. There are more churches in early medieval Ireland than there are in Ireland today. But what is right, so again, very striking, isn't it? You see, so that idea that somehow there was some kind of pagan, kind of Celtic, Jewry kind of world, uh, you know, which underpinned it, that's. That's what I'm saying, probably don't say. That's nonsense. Okay, I'm in the church after all. Uh, but what is striking there is this is the earliest known church in Ireland. And this is currently hidden. It's down on the Black Peninsula in Kerry, excavated by John Sheen. It's the earliest security dated church. But it's tiny. It's literally about four meters by two meters. It's a very humble building. It's surrounded by a circle. It's got the church. It's got the cross paths, which are the, the grave of the founder, the shrine. It's got everything to do with the church except it's kind of tiny and slim down. And it was a minute, it's very small wooden church uh, here. Right? But it's got the three features the church, the enclosure, of the circle over around it. The tomb of the founder, which comprised the things that were considered to confer sanctity and holiness in that period. Now, I can guarantee you, maybe most of us, I don't know, read them myself, intend to, but most of us probably don't even know about Cahar the Hill, but it's the earliest known church in the Irish tradition, but it has everything that later attaches and adheres to the church. I also want to say that five and a half thousand churches, one of the things that the Irish church had at that stage was. Rights of unity. If you were a, a monk or a priest, you had the right to travel between these various political kingdoms into which Ireland was a fragment. And that brought a high degree of cultural cohesion and a consciousness too of Ireland as a whole. The idea of the dead Irish, which is what Columba and others were talking about. The Irish didn't think of themselves as dirty dog people or Wexford people or rather discontented people. They talk. And it works for me. Now, I should be not. So I know it's like the game when I get a chance. Okay. The point about it being, they, you know, people sometimes think, oh my god, they were all little petty, petty kingdoms and, you know, they, they didn't have any understanding. I thought they were right. Oh yes, they did. They're an island. They knew about that. But it was the people who moved through it that carried that. And you get something else as well. That Ireland is the only country in Europe where Latin never became a vernacular. Other countries adopted Latin. In Ireland, vernacular literacy emerged astonishingly early. And we, in this little island, we have the oldest written vernacular outside of Greek and uh, Roman, La uh, Latin, Greek and Latin. We have the oldest written vernacular and the oldest continuous tradition in literary production of any country in Europe. And the Irish had that self confidence, that same thing. The Irish regarded their own language, Irish, as at least 
the equal of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, there's a remarkable story, actually, uh, that the monk was saying, God, is uh, tell the story about Irish guys in Charlemagne's kingdom, the great uh, Carlos Magnus Charlemagne. And then uh, this is a fair, and this monk comes to walk through the fair, and he sees these two um, Irish guys, and they're standing at a, a stall with absolutely nothing in it. You know, the Germans are there selling their schnitzels or the rotten strudel or, you know, their beautiful um, shoes or whatever, saddles or horses, whatever. Here's these two Irish guys, and uh, he describes what happens. When the pursuit of the army had been almost forgotten throughout all this realm, two Irishmen came from Ireland to the coast of Gaul, along with some British traders. These Irishmen were unrivaled for their skill in sacred and secular learning, and when the crowd pressed around them every day for business, they exhibited no wares but shouted, Hey, anyone who desires wisdom, draw near and get it from us. We have wisdom for sale. Two Irish chancellors, <laughs> chancellors around. And uh, they're brought to Charlemagne and he sets them up and they, uh, you know, they do set up wisdom as a board because the Irish had at that stage a um, very strong foundation in Latin grammar, in Greek, and, and you know, and were more able to teach in a very dramatic kind of way. And because I have a few of my students here now, it amuses me, maybe not them, but it amuses me to uh, give this form. The Irish are everywhere across Europe in this period. The Irish, like, not insular, not island-based people at all. And we're already out and about and across a lot of Europe. This is a poem by an exiled Irishman, the Hermes Exo. And it's the very earliest eclogue, the very earliest form of this type of poem which appears in Europe and it emerged out of the early, early Car Carolingian poem. And I'm going to murder it in Latin and then Stephen will read it properly in English. And this is directed to uh, everyone here who's a student. And this is an Irish pedagogue, an Irish teacher, encouraging or exhorting his students to work hard. The skita no poel, docilis kita dorito aica, tempora caitorum, axel ande dion. Ardente utsunipes carpe terra aicora fusu, si fora hu humilis no momenta lari. Corvata facile inente catuba in Virgia, sabrigitos ramos flectore, nemo vale. Don facilis anna bobus in forte sodares, discere ne pitia cita super ne dea, ne bene congestum spatium perdatis inane, nam sin, sine doctrina vita per homine. Learn, my boys, the age for learning, quickly passes, time flies by. As the heavens spin, the days fall. Just as a swift horse gallops eagerly over the course, so youth sailed by, alas, without lingering as it passes. The pliant tip of the twig curves easily beneath pressure, but no one can bend the stiff bows. While your minds are still receptive, comrades, waste no time and learn the divine commands of God. Do not squander the time generously granted to you, for without learning, our life perishes. And uh, the second thing I want to, to talk about here is um, Donatus. This is a uh, bishop of Pizzola, which is in Italy. And again, this is a poem written in the mid 9th century. It's in some respects an age of poem, uh, where he's looking back at our and he was from Fifth of God. There comes that moment. When you live abroad, where you forget the things that annoy you in Ireland and make you want to leave the damn place, the rain, if you're sending in too many hurting or whatever it might be, and then that fades and then the thing comes back up that you miss, you know, what do you miss? And then suddenly you flooded with the uh, exercise perceptive, perception of Ireland. So uh, I want to pick the Latin on here. So this is the Natus, the Bishop of Fisola, in the translation by the great star, Lee Prepare. The noblest share of earth is the far western world, whose name is written Scotia in the ancient books. Rich in goods, in silver, jewels, cloth and gold, the mind to the body in air and mellow soil. With honey and with milk flow islands, lovely plains, 
with silk and arms, abundant fruit with art and men. Worthy are the Irish to well dwell in this their land, a race renowned in war, in peace, in faith. So my point here is uh, how intellectual they were. These were very gifted in terms of poetry and very gifted in other ways too. Look at this marvelous um, depiction of uh, the uh, the loaves and the fishes, uh, and also as often in our something odd in it as well. We have on the right hand side there that strange creature called the lamprey, and I know from Adam as in the audience, and he may be able to tell me. But uh, uh, what is the land for it in, uh, there would be what uh, my point is. But that's in granite, which is really hard to carve. And if you saw that and somebody told you it was done by Picasso or Brack or somebody in the area trying to attend to, you wouldn't bat an eye. Incredibly sophisticated uh, sense of the power of carving. And uh, this is one of the great things in Ireland, I want to kind of say. But we have these great things in mind. This is from the High Cross of Moon down in Castle Ireland, from South there. We have thousands upon thousands of these magnificent things which are still exactly in the same place they've always been. In other places, they're in museums or whatever. In Ireland, they're still there in the landscape which uh, foster them. And, I'll take the next one down. No. And uh, again, to go back to these churches, it seems that uh, everywhere you go, you get these churches. And if the circular uh, enclosure, you can see down here at the bottom. This is down in the Hook Peninsula in Wexford. This is Kim Mulcahy. And uh, you can see, um, you can see the round structure, which is the town, the, uh, the boundary around the town. Still there, um, and still embedded in the landscape, right? But the whole Irish landscape is dotted with these things. So, for example, this is this incredible map by uh, Matthew Spout, um, which shows every known, by Matt Houseman, every known church from the area that you live here. And this is just a stretch of coffee, okay, and not a prayer. Um, but look at, the, uh, look at the density of churches. It's just astonishing to be a bit of long for the most common as well. Like there's churches maybe every two and a half miles. In, in Ireland, it was considered that uh, to attend Mass on Sunday, two and a half miles was uh, the length you were expected to walk. So therefore, it was every, every two and a half miles, to, uh, every five miles, then there was a church. Look at the density of all those churches. That's the point I want to make. This was very, very powerfully inflected in, and it's also it's also something which lasts an incredibly long time. This is the magnificent monastic site of Inishmori, in just off Slido of Bay, uh, where essentially it survived intact until the 17th century. And in some ways, it just looks Okay, there's a roof for two missions. But it just looks like the, the monks or the priests of the war by the Sundays, and we had just walked out of the kitchen. Now we've got loads of these things, but that happens to be a pretty fine example. But the, the, the density, the beauty, but also the absolute integrity and continuity of the practice is amazing. And in some respects, you could say that in Ireland there were seven centuries of conformity in the nature of the church architecture that developed. But although plain, in some ways unsophisticated in plan, these churches express a very sophisticated geological understanding steeped in scriptural and patristic moments. And you see, I think what had happened in Ireland, and we're playing a World Cup in Japan, a uh, short bit, uh, so I'm going to make this point, the transmission of the ancient form was much more important than the actual transmission of ancient material. So the, the, in a way you could think of the Irish churches, and remember the vast bulk of them were wooden, not stone. But the usual comparison is with Japanese and Korean wooden temples, where the materials are perishable, but the style is stable, and now the building has been incrementally built, bit by bit, you would place this to the temple this year, the next year, the next year. The shape of the structure remains the same, the materials are updated, but the, the degree of continuity and the power that's invested in the form is amazing. So while the church might experience multiple iterations, the sense of permanency was achieved through replicating this ideal shape, still here in the 17th century, rather than through the preservation of actual fabric. And I think that's a, a remarkable thing. Um, but again, just to finish on this area period, um, and I'll take the next one, Robert, the, this is from the great scholar, uh, Donald Cormac, unfortunately, um, recently uh, died, 
and put that place past the way. Past the way is the way of the day, the idea the of death, which is um, a problem in modern secular society. Now, look, this is what he, this is a list of what he produced, of what innovations the Irish intellectually produced in this area of the period. And I'm not going to go down there, but the Irish were, of course, for example, to separate words, to make it easier for to read. They produced this amazing set of biblical exegesis explanations of the Bible. There was over 30 surviving grammars and handbooks. The, uh, they produced the earliest penitentials, the first two pioneer private pens. We have all the stuff, the vernacular at all, which was sometimes called the grand, not necessarily a great term for it. But anyway, uh, you know, they produced architectural forms like the High Cross and the Mount, which are distinctive. They produced this amazing and dynamic diaspora. This is a church and a culture which is self confident, outward looking, creative, and has a very, very high um, intellectual uh, quotient. Uh, with me. So I want to kind of uh, uh, emphasize that, right? Because my point here, my point in the book really is that Irish Christianity has gone through many different manifestations. That's what the one we might make at the moment is we're going through another one at the moment. And sometimes people tend to be, if you are um, Catholic, you might kind of think, oh my God, the world's going to have a half passage or whatever, but why I think you need to take the longer term perspective. Right? What you can see is there's been many different manifestations of what it means to be Christian or Catholic in this island. And that oftentimes what happens is that uh, a new version emerges out of and maybe some of the failings of the old ones. Now, I'll take the next one there on. So now we come to the main meeting period. You see, now things switch, don't they? Because now you've got our near and dear and beloved neighbours uh, over in England. Coming in the guise of Normans. I think the term Norman was really invented by a fellow countryman, got an uh, orphan to disguise the fact that really they saw themselves as English, not as Normans, and they, uh, they had a, a very strong um, English dimension to them. But when they came, they came bearing not gifts, but they did bear gifts, but they brought with them the idea of English superiority over Irish culture. The idea also that the Irish church had stagnated and had become, in some ways, not necessarily a great um, example of up-to-date Christianity. That the Irish church had stagnated, and by doing that, that it was now behind the standard, as it were, for Christianity as a whole. And what you see now is this remarkable change in Christianity in, in Western Europe, with the first uh, crusade of 1095, which was triggered really by uh, the very powerful surge of Islam at that period, and then by the great schism of uh, 1054, which split what we now call the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Churches apart. So the jolt to Europe, created by the rise of Islam, and created then by, as I said, the separation of the Eastern Church, created the need for a new version of Christianity, a new version of uh, the way the church organizes that, and it moves then to particularly the creation of the great teaching orders. This is the time of the Franciscans, of the Dominicans, of the Augustinians, right? And what it does really is to attack the existing Irish church, but it comes, the attack comes from the first, especially with people like Malachi or Mayonema, which, which kind of attack the Irish church, says Bernard Clairvaux, and I'm going to come to the Cistercians in a moment, 1149. Attack the Irish as Christians in name, but pagans in fact. And also, this comes with a double bunny, because the Irish are now also culturally accused of barbarism, and you get this uh, amazing um, transition, where the Irish were once seen as leaders in the church, and much admired, but now described, the Pope in 1172, described the Irish, I translate here, as barbarous, uncivilized, and ignorant of divine law, undisciplined, untamed, and filthy. In some ways, the 12th century was a PR disaster for the existing Irish church, and then you move to this. This is the Cistercian, the geography of monasticism, where you get these new, powerful orders. It's usually a bit about the distinction between a monk and a friar. Monks can first, the Greek word monachos, means solitary or a friar, and monks did in spiritual communities that we drew from the secular world to concentrate on meditation prayer and their personal prayer. Now, by this stage, people begin to say, this is just self-indulgence, this is nonsense, the new world is emerging, you've got the towns, you've got commerce, you've got the emergence of feudalism, the church needs, needs to engage, and this kind of thing I've been down to the land of the No use. So the monastic 
movement now moves towards a very powerful sense that the church should move from self-indulgent and ruthless to engage with people and to meet them where they now live. This is a special time. Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying. Okay, you're all right, good. Which is the Latin frat phrase of brothers. No, we're not going to do it. This is hard. Not just about getting a hurry, it's about being here. <laughs> okay. If I talk across this, you're going to be super annoying. Go ahead. Oh, uh, there we go. Silence is going. So the flyers. So the flyers which is Latin practically for brother, saw solidarity with the world and to make a difference within it. And they practiced mainly, you see, to express their trust in providence and to ensure that they remained in constant contact with ordinary life. They deliberately stayed barefoot. St. Francis, for example, wanted to be barefoot. This has because he wanted to kind of say, we should rely on the kindness of other Christians, the people we come in contact with, we should not be rich and powerful and own possessions or whatever. And the idea then too was that the reliance on the kindness of strangers, as it were, would also be what would put the friars in intimate touch with the realities of other people's lives. That you would know their stories, you would, you would also know their sorrows, and therefore you would be able to minister to them in a particular kind of way. So the flyers think engagement with the world, engagement with people, not retreat from it, and they want to be in the messy, noisy, modern trading world. And that is deeply charismatic fire, Dominic, Francis, they exude spiritual energy, dedicated to a social engagement that married passion to purpose. And the fire that emerged in a powerful kind of way to do this. So now you get in the 1220s, here in Dublin, for example, the Mendicants, the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Carmelites, the Abyssinians, they've all arrived in Dublin. Look at this, and it's a, a European-wide phenomenon. This is their home where, uh, where the uh, secessions are, and then the dog has that. Look at how many there are in Ireland. And this is a continental movement which is bringing Ireland back into the mainstream of uh, Christianity. Okay, and if you look at Dublin here, again, this is the point I'm trying to make. The, you have the Viking core of Dublin, you have the medieval wall city, but then look what's around it. It's all these um, alleys, like St. Mary's um, Abbey on the north side there, St. Thomas's Abbey in the in the Liberty, St. Mary's Priory, St. Sepulchre's, St. Francis, where the Franciscans are, and most important of all, all saints, which eventually became uh, Trinity College. And if you look at the courtyard of Trinity College, it's still on the, the footprint, on the, the ghostly outline of the existing um, uh, church. So again, I'm just saying all of this kind of comes in, but look where they are, that all the churches ring the wall city, where people come into the city. It's a remarkable kind of expression in the landscape or the geography of a, of a, what had kind of happened. Now again, I'm not going to talk about that in any great detail, but what I'm going to point out is that this is again a different version of the church, but this time too, the churches also carry a cultural um, orientation because the implication might also be that this new church is also associated with the rise of English power, the rise of European norms, and with a repudiation or a critique of the existing Irish church. Now again, it's very striking. And I think our historiography, the writing of our history, doesn't really sufficiently acknowledge this, even to the present day. And that is the extent to which Irish society was absorbed. That was able to take on this challenge. And eventually, rather than the Irish conversion towards, um, shall we say, English norms, by the 14th, 15th century, it's the Hibernians, Ipsis, Hibernians, that the newcomers have become more Irish than the Irish themselves. And by the 15th, 16th century, take the next one there, Robert, you know, you get this remarkable thing. This would not happen, I think, to the present day. And that is that in the 15th, 16th century of the Gaelic Revival, there's an enormous energy and innovation in the church in the West of Ireland. Look at all these foundations uh, from 1420 to 1530. Like it's, it's Dawn, it's Mayor, it's Dunny which are leading the charge now. 
No one in Ireland would tend to think that things start in Dublin and then spread to the United West. But what's happening in the area around Dublin there, guys? No fire on the road there. Okay? There's not even one in Dublin. And there's a meeting saying in Kazakhstan, in Kazakhstan, there's not one in me. Uh, you know, so that is a remarkable thing that is west of the Shannon. There's this amazing energy. And what I also want to say about this is this is a Gaelic church. It's Irish speaking. Irish speaking. The Franciscans in particular, who as I said, want to meet people where they work, embrace the language. The great learning in this period comes from uh, the Franciscans. Kind of book of uh, It doesn't mean poor, uh, one of the great poets. It doesn't mean poor, but it means a pity book that he belongs to a man. But they, they, they have this thing like this amazing uh, relationship between the church and the Irish speaking community in the Western Bank. And also with the Dublin family. And here too is the, the traditional learning. This is the great heyday of the Bardic poets. This is the great heyday of what we sometimes call the Brahman laws. But it's also again as an area of very deep intellectual. The Irish had Irish culture. Not the English speaking culture, Irish speaking culture had four specialist areas of knowledge. Shanachus, which means history. Filiot, which is the poetry. Phoenix, which means law. And Lice, which means medicine. And hereditary families manage those kind of things. Right? So there's a remarkable... Okay, thanks for that There's a remarkable um, uh, set of uh, things which go on here. This is a map by Catherine Sims, which shows, in essence, the Gaelic Church. Because what also happens here is you get the aircrafts, who are the hereditary families who look after the church property, but you also get a good deal, and that's not for the treatment of hereditary priesthood, where the priesthood is literally passing from father to son to dispensation. But look again, look again at the geography of that. There's a little bit down there around my own uh, neck of the woods on the borders between Carmel, Wexford and Wicklow, where the Catholics have been quite strong. But look, look, you really have to cross the Shannon. And then you've got that remarkable world of Connacht, and then also, especially West Coast, at this period, which is deeply embedded in the, um, the a very distinctive form of Christianity. Again, my point here is, there's been many different manifestations of how can do that. Okay, the next one there are. So now we come to something else. That world is busy, active, going about its own business. And then out of the great group, younger in a way, well, not, not really, but out of, uh, out of the turmoil comes a critique of the existing Christian church, which eventually ends up, and it's a great piece of branding, isn't it, to call it the Reformation. In some ways, that's a con job as well. The medieval Western Europe between the 7th and the 15th century was remarkably stable in terms of its configuration of religion and government. Right? But now you've got this turn away from Rome at this period, but the strength and integrity of the pre existing church is now much more acknowledged. In the past, we took on board the propaganda of the reformers that the church was on its last legs and was corrupt and all those kind of things. It's now much more clearly seen that that wasn't really the case. It wasn't a, a spent force deservedly collapsing under the weight of its own corruption. But instead, the late medieval church was actually deeply embedded in the lives and more importantly, the affections of ordinary people. But now we get this, this new world, doesn't it, which begins, this is a, from you check the theater. It's the attack on, it's literally iconoclasm, the breaking of icons. And now you get this sharp, severe break in what had hitherto been the unity of Western Christian. In some ways, we're still living with that. And where did it come from? In some ways, it came out of the discovery, or maybe more accurately, the rediscovery of the Atlantic in 1492, which promoted the great extroversion, the great turning outwards of Europe, away from its old, warm, classical heart in the Mediterranean. Plato had accused the Greeks of popping like frogs around the pond. But then this amazing surge of energy sweeps through Europe and it sweeps up particularly into its Atlantic range because now the facade, the European facade, the Atlantic facade facing towards America is what we drive the energy. But by the time Elizabeth I came in, Europe has suffered this internal gash or tear. You've got this um, new religious internal country. Up to that, Europe's frontier had been Islamic places. It had been facing a powerful surge of Islam. And Christianity had worried about that. That's 
website launched the good side, that was the launch from Tafel, the launch from fear that Islam continues to spread in Europe. But now you've got this secondary problem, which is that Europe itself divides, and Europe now essentially spends 100 years, 150 years fighting bloody wars. It eventually settles. But when it settles, I'll take the next one. When it settles, it's really now created a divide between Southern Europe and Northern Europe. This is a map showing the great um, Baroque Cathedral, which in some ways are the holding wall, the holding line, which prevents Northern Reform Protestant from penetrating into the uh, heartland of uh, Northern and the, the categories of um, you know, what became the Habsburg Empire. It's a remarkable thing, isn't it? There's a whole geography in that. But the Catholics now respond to bells and smells, to incense, to these magnificent churches, and they kind of, in a way, create a wall which prevents the northern reform Protestant from, from um, penetrating in. But what in that, though, what is the striking feature? It's that northern Europe turns Protestant and crude here now. Bear with me, very crude. But basically, the only country in northern Europe which stays Catholic is Ireland. And now we've got this curious situation where Europe itself is bristling and jostling each other over whether they're Catholic, whether they're Protestant. But Northern and Europe, by and large, comes Protestant, but Ireland remains the anomaly. Ireland is a Catholic country in a sea of Protestants, of the Reformed Church. And I talk in the book about those Reformed Churches, so I don't want to think I'm uh, just uh, focusing on the, the Catholic side of the equation, but that's not what I want to kind of talk about tonight. In 1568, Carl Bacchaia and Ulos Surgeon, writing in Irish and Translation, that nothing is here given respect or honour to any holy house since Elizabeth had came out. And he accused the English, who sat shown, he accused the English of being the most people in the whole of Europe. Is Ubrecht from Van Yorka for Elida. And Elizabeth herself entered the unforgiving folk, folk memory of Ireland as Elisha Walker, Elizabeth of Death. Because now it's in the late 16th century that English can say enough of this half another enough of the Irish, we're going to dominate you, we're going to get rid of all this petty kingdom, we're going to plant the hell out of um, Ulster. So Europe when it's settled in some ways, also did something else. It basically came to the conclusion that the only way to stabilize Europe was to create a synchrony between the state and the religion. That whatever the religion of the monarch was, or the dominant power, that had to be the religion of everybody, and then for any other religious minorities in it, they had to accept the status of being a heathen church, a clandestine church, and they could not expect to see themselves acknowledged or even um, seem to exist within the state for, uh, proper. So you get this uh, amazing sense that each state needed one religion, what is sometimes called in the jargon, an Erastian state. Again, problematic for Ireland. The 1559 Act of Supremacy in England, which established the idea that, that the King of England, or the monarch of England, was the head of the Catholic Church says, and this is much quoted by Mr. Boris Johnson at the moment. No foreign prince, person, credit, state, or potentate had or ought to have any jurisdiction, power, superiority, preeminence, or authority, ecclesiastic or spiritual, within this realm. You know, Britain faces Europe, and now Britain has gone with the Protestant tradition, and now it wants to describe its Christian tradition in the beginning of bringing a piece of brandy as Roman as if it was something foreign, as if the religion which had nourished England for centuries and centuries had was somehow something which had been fostered on something which was foreign and how English was required its own religion. But notice there, that same thing, that antagonism towards Europe, and in the sense that antagonism towards the Catholicism. Now in Ireland, what is striking is that there was no essential Protestant Reformation from below in Ireland. It was an imposed thing. There was simply no Irish born Protestant in number at the start or heart of the Reformation project in Ireland. By 1600, there were only 120 Irish born Protestants on the whole island. 120. 
In the city of Dublin, out of a total population of 10,000, a mere 20 attended Protestant themselves. So in a sense, what Ireland experienced was not so much the Protestant Reformation as an English Protestant Reformation. And one historian, in Dublin, really describes Henry as rebranding a paid Protestant state as an Iron Kingdom, imposed, so the Reformation was imposed in Ireland from outside and above by a violently coercive state. By contrast, then, the Irish Catholics dig in, because they're not just resist, uh, resisting a religious imposition, they're resisting a cultural The O'Donnells, in the late 16th century work, the Dolly Dog called Godfrey Old Macamore, remained a shell or sham, which means in possession of their ancestral land, took us an all of Irish, created right in the church, and accordingly, the Kindle of Coy on credit. Everyone kept the faith. But it's the, the rootedness in the land and the culture, the sense of the, the chiefs and others supporting the church, the old church, and we need that too. That sense, therefore, that everybody kept the faith, retained the faith, because to give it up was not just to turn bugs and bugs, to abandon your Irishness and to acknowledge the legitimacy of the conflict. And this commitment to Catholicism would therefore prevent Ireland helplessly securing through anglicisation or becoming a Saxa old, a young England or a little uh, England in the words of the 16th century Ulster Franciscan court, old or lucky. Now, we come to, and again I'm going to race through this, and I talk quite a bit about it in the book, but this is the era that we, you know, those of us who are traditional uh, Catholics, um, you know, went to school. <laughs> When I went to school, back in another, uh, another uh, century and another millennium, we all know about this. This is the penal era. This is the penal era where it really carried a price if you wanted to be a uh, Catholic. And this is the period of the Babylonian captivity. This is uh, from the Jeremiah, where it kind of says, you know, they showed the Irish um, in exile, like the Irish, like the um, Hebrews in exile in Egypt. But the Irish, unlike the Hebrews, are in exile as it were in their own country. And that's what's hard to bear. It's hard to bear having a, a minority religion dominate over a majority one, because by the 18th century, 85% would we say, could we say, 85% of Ireland remains happy, but they are dominated by a minority church. So they have to kind of come inside. And what we have to understand is, I think you mentioned that, is there's a stalling kind of anger with that. And the anger is based on the idea, a sorrow stone experience, where the Irish, to no fault of their own as they would see it, they ended up on the wrong side of history. They become internal exiles in their own land, suffering the tame, sour rule of dispossession. And that dislocation, when ancient sites were lost in Catholic worship, is captured in a verse about Derry. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether this is London Derry, as we have been taught to call it, or whether this is uh, a townland somewhere adjacent. But uh, in the Irish it says, and Stephen would then read in English, A dear God, a dear God, what through pillar of his father God, what cross will she know to the God of it, in a colony, he speak the Lord with your God. Little Derry, little Derry, my hazelnut and my jewel is my affliction that fate has decreed that Protestants will be living in the heart of my little Derry. And this is the period when famously the same Christ was on the head of a priest as a wolf. It's the period uh, in Bruce when the Irish Parliament, exclusively Protestant, proposed that Catholic Bishop the Catholic priests, and especially anybody the Jesuits that had that down and uh, fear of the Jesuits, should be castrated in Father Arnold. Uh, the British Parliament refused to enact that, but the Irish Parliament initially proposed that Catholic priests, if Father Arnold, should be castrated. And then, you know, priests felt that. This is a, a translation this one from uh, Irish, but this is a poem again from the county of uh, Derry, as I would call it, um, uh, from the uh, period of deep. Uh, depression. So it's a, a poem from the penal days, and this is the object of this of being forced by a priest who's on the run and who's fearful of being captured. A cuckoo doesn't call from the branch, nor a seagull from the valley. I don't dim 
is an insect or a shadow that I do not think is a host of the foreigners. When I hear the sounds of my feet or snag a bush behind me, I think it is the chase bearing down on me here, there, everywhere. So now the Catholics again find themselves in some respects socially as well pushed down. So they become in some respects a poor people, but a poor people who are poor because they're on the wrong side of the state and the wrong side of religion. And this is something which the Irish Catholic Church has to kind of get used to. Uh, Irish Catholics in some ways were infinitely more educated in what we could call the school of historical harm, not whether I'm sorry to say their upholds or reasonable in English counterpart were generally drawn more from the upper class. The English dramatist Alan Bennett, uh, who's very, his diaries are brilliant, if you want a good laugh reading. Really. But uh, Alan Bennett talked ab about his feelings when he saw a red faced Irish nun over in England. I can never be a Catholic because I'm such a snob. But the Irish, the battle hardened Irish Catholics, uh, found ways of evading this and of clinging uh, strongly to their own faith. And they also found ways of kind of uh, as a Borch and Berkman. But it's the, the correlation now between um, the Catholic culture and the Irish language culture both of which were despised by the English Protestant state in her, is the combination between them now that comes in. This is a poem called uh, Stephen's Belfast um, compatriot, uh, Kieran Carson. It's called Spencer's Army, and the Edward Spencer, of course, was the one who advocated the genocide army, and of course, famous now as one of the great English poets. But he had literally advocated uh, genocide uh, in Ireland, and this poem is about the relationship between the perception of the Irish and the reality. Rick heavy horse boys, kerns, gallow glasses, cows, guards, captains, robberies, their foreign women folk, swords, dice, whiskey, chess, harps, word horns, bows and arrows, all are hid within the foldings of their Irish club. Fit house for an outlaw, meat bed for a rebel. This whore's wardrobe is convenient for a thief, and when it freezes, it becomes his tabernacle. In whose snow he finds Hibernian relief. Then there is the big, thick bush of hair hanging down over their eyes, a glint, they call it, in their skin. They do not recognize the power of the crown. At the drop of a hat, they are wont to vanish into deep, dark woods. Forever in the main, they drink and talk too much. Not all of it is gibberish. So it's a, it's a remarkable uh, poem in a way because it captures the sense of difference, but also the sense that something in there might be significant, not all of it is uh, givers, but the, the cultural kind of dislocation is uh, equally important. And I'm going to kind of fast forward because I'm conscious of the time. I'll just push back there one for a second.